Hi, I'm Eric Jurgensen, a hobbyist blacksmith from Oklahoma City. Welcome to my basement shop. This video is going to introduce making coils for the Li Hua 15A induction heater. I will also show the details of making my first two, or say two and a half, coils. Let's get started. Coils are made from copper tubing and attached to the front panel of the LH-15A with two 8mm flare nuts. My unit also came with two extra fittings to screw on to the ones that are attached to the front panel so that these can take the wear and tear of putting on and removing coils and when they wear out I can unscrew them and replace them easily. Because 8mm flare nuts are rarer than unicords in the US I went ahead and ordered my supplies from my Li Hua distributor. I asked for 8mm tubing, 6mm tubing, and a supply of the 8mm flare nuts. They also included these pre-flared 8mm stubs. That was a good thing because the 6mm and 8mm tubing they included is thicker than the 1mm thick that I anticipated. 8mm tubing with a 1mm wall like this will allow 6mm tubing to slip in. So I needed these. The thicker tubing is nice because it has less electrical resistance, so there's less energy loss. If you want to try to get tubing in the US, there is another option. You can use 5 16th tubing. That is just slightly undersized for 8 millimeters. In fact, it's so close that I just use my 5 16th flaring tool to flare my 8 millimeter tubing. However, you still need the 8 millimeter nuts. And 5 16ths is not terribly common. 3 eighths is, quarter is, 5 16ths you probably need to go to a plumbing supply house, not just your local hardware supply. The specifications call for a coil that is between 200 and 600 centimeters long. I interpret that to be for the coil portion, not including the leads. It's a rule of thumb, however. The real requirement is that the coil exhibit an inductance in an unspecified range that will appropriately resonate with the LC tank circuit that is the heart of this induction heater. That is a complicated subject that depends not only on coil geometry, but also on the temperature and size and shape of the metal currently inserted for heating. At some point, I plan to use inductance measurements to tune coils. If I have any success with that, I'll make a video on it. Now. Let's take a look at my first coil. One project on my bucket list is to forge an axe head. I plan to follow Gerald Boggs instructions for a welded eye axe from one and a half inch by one half inch stock. There's a link to this article in the description below. It seemed appropriate to make a coil optimized for the resulting one and a half inch by one inch material. I was wrong about that, but first let's make the coil. I only had one piece of one and a half inch by one half inch stock, so I added some one inch by half inch and half inch square to make a mandrel for bending. I needed the mandrel to be proud of the nominal one and one half inch by one inch, so I folded up newspaper and added it as a wrapping. This coil is made with eight millimeter tubing. Instead of pre-cutting, I wrapped the coil and then cut it from the tubing spool. Using my bender, I bent a 45 degree to lead into the coil. Then I bent a 45 the other direction to start the coil, clamped it into place, and bent it 90. I had decided not to pack sand into the coil to resist kinks. Overall, I don't regret that decision, but this bend in particular flattened too much for my taste. I took it to the anvil to lightly hammer it out. After that, I wrapped the rest without so much effort to get tight corners. Overall, that was adequate, but it did lead to a slightly sloppy coil. I only bent the last curve 45 degrees to match the other end, and then used the tubing bender to establish the exit. After severing the work from the spool, I used a musket tool that I forged in a class with Jim Hoffman to spread the coils. Touching coils will short-circuit your loops, so fixing this is a must. Any wide, flat-bit screwdriver would have done but a hand-forged tool was at hand and suited the irony of using such a modern way to heat iron for an ancient craft. It's very important to slip the flare nuts onto the tubing in the correct orientation before flaring. I put a little oil on the flaring cone to prevent galling. 
I wasn't sure exactly how to position the end of the tubing since this was my first time to use a flaring tool. I learned the hard way that the tubing should be flush with the side of the tool and not proud like this. Here it is at the correct depth. As you can hopefully see, one of the ends galled just a bit. I cleaned that out before I put the coil into service. The final dimensions look pretty good. Between 30 or more layers of that newsprint and the rebound of the copper itself, there's about the right amount of room to heat a folded piece of that one and one half inch by one inch stock. But I should have reviewed Gerald's video first. He spreads the cheeks of the blade before welding in the bit. This will work for the first weld near the eye, but I'll need a wider coil for the rest. Oh well, this coil has proven plenty useful making a pot rack for my wife's birthday. I guess I'll have to make another coil before I start the axe. This second coil is for longer heats. It is 6 inches long and made from 29 inches of 6 millimeter tubing. The inner diameter of the coil is just over 1 inch. The asymmetry wasn't intended, I just misestimated where to start coiling. I clamped a lead of about 4 inches onto my winding jig. 6 inches would have been better. That would have fixed the asymmetry. This jig wound a nice coil. I'll make a separate video detailing making the jig. Now I'll clamp on some vice grips so I can get a good grip on this and just wind up the coil. Notice that I'm winding the lead so that it's 90 degrees past the line of the other lead. And in a mere two tries I can figure out which way to spin it off. Now I need to bend each lead sort of backwards to line them up parallel. I'll use my tubing bender to do this and I need to clamp it in the vise to get a good purchase on things. Unfortunately the vise um, doesn't have quite enough room so I need to stick some metal pieces in there as kind of jaw extensions so that I can grip just one part of the coil and then bend it backwards. We'll just skip the struggle and go straight to the bending. A little bit of effort to get the leads coming straight out. After the first bend, they're actually canted out still a little bit by the uh, angle of the coil. Having worked out the clamping details on the first round, this second round went a lot easier. No need to skip. And it's angled outward a little bit, so I'm going to bend it inward just a bit. Tongs are going to give me the purchase to do that smoothly. It's actually easy to overbend if you do it with just your hand. 
The extra leverage from the tongs means that I'm not pushing as hard and I can control the sudden yield of the copper as it starts to bend a little better. Looks pretty good. I used the bender to bend the leads first out and then I bent them in so that they would line up parallel. So there I'm demonstrating how I first bent them out and then I bent them in. And there's the unfortunate asymmetry. If I had measured twice and cut once, it would have been better. I also needed to file off the uh, ridge that was raised from cutting and do the same thing with the interior just to ensure good water flow. And since I'm soldering, I'll take the uh, pad and scuff, scuff all the oxide off the copper. I had to do a little bit of additional flaring to get those to slide on. Um, I basically have a, a bickern that I use, or a, a stake anvil, with a fairly sharp point on it, and I use that to flare them out just a little bit, and then I drove it over some cop other copper tubing so that they would, would stretch just a little bit, and then I could slide them on. As you can see here, I'm sliding them on uh, probably an inch. That lines up nicely with the flare fitting, so let's move on to the soldering. Now I'm applying some soldering flux. The flare nuts have to go on now. There's no slipping them on after the flares are in place. I've got an induction heater, so why not use that to do the soldering? This is my first attempt to solder with an induction heater, and I'm pretty clumsy at it. I'm trying to heat the metal and the solder all at once. No, that's not going to work. I'm just melting off the solder. It turns out that it takes quite a while for at least this coil, and note that the coil is pretty large with respect to the 8mm slash 6mm tubing, so it's not really a surprising. It's like, it's like heating up a quarter inch stock, which that coil really struggles to do. So it's going to take me a little while to get it up to heat, but I'm getting the feel of it and eventually I'll get it to heat. It's not there and the solder will melt right into the joint. And now it's ready. Yep, it's melting in quite nicely. Uh, the coil is hot all the way back. And you saw me jump when I brushed the edge of the coil. Copper conducts heat really well, so it's heating up all the way to my glove. All right, so the second one's just like it. Let's go faster through this one. Not quite there. There we go. Let's try this coil out. This is some 3 8 inch diameter round stock. As you can see, it's actually starting to glow pretty quickly. Overall, this is going to take about 60 seconds to reach a bright yellow heat. Um, but the coil is heating it up nicely. This is so much better 
than shuffling the stock back and forth in the short coil that came stock with my unit. Somewhere in here, and I can't see it in the video, but I could see it when I was there, in about 40 seconds it started scaling heavily. So that would be about 600, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about now, I think. Uh, and it continued to heat from there. I also tried some 5 8 inch diameter sucker rod. Uh, that's what I usually use for the tongs, 5 8 or 3 quarters. And it, if anything, it heated faster. Uh, that's counterintuitive, but induction heaters are often that way because the larger stock actually couples with more magnetic flux, so it can dump more heat into it. Well, so here we are. Pretty happy with this coil. Next time I make a long, loose coil like this, I plan to flatten the loops at either end. That is, not as steep an angle as the rest of the helix. That will concentrate a little more magnetic flux at the ends, and the heating there will compensate a bit for the loss of heat to the cold stock on either side of the, the heat zone. As a final topic, let's look at how I tested a third coil without actually making it. With my long coil, I thought it might work better with fewer loops so I shorted out the last two loops. This is standard practice in developing coils. I used some scrap 6mm tubing and carefully crimped one end onto the coil and secured it the other end with a short length of 10 gauge wire. Don't use vice grips or plastic spring clamps. They will heat significantly. You don't have to use tubing, but you must use a very heavy gauge, something in the range of a welding lead. As you can see, it doesn't appear to heat faster. The limiting factor is the loop spacing. That suggests that five loops is reasonable for a one inch diameter coil, and that the coil spacing determines the physical length of the heat and also how long it takes. So, if I find I often want a three inch or four inch heat, I'll make another five loop coil with an appropriately tighter spacing. Until next time, in the words of blacksmith Jim Coke, forge on and make beautiful things.